welcome Dr. Andrew Lumsengroom. Right. Good morning, all. How are we all doing? I'm Dr. Lumsengroom. Thank you for the lovely introduction, Ricardo. Um, I'm Dr. Andrew Lumsengroom. I'm a chief chief economist at the House of Trading. So, what does that mean? Well, you heard my colleague earlier, Luke, talk about trade. You heard him talk about charts, but you also heard him talk about risk. You heard him talk about politics. You heard him talk about economics. You heard him talk about market conditions. That's my bit. My job is to make sure my head of desk can inform his traders every single day of what market conditions are, what's likely to happen, what the risk in the market is, and how it all pulls together. So what I'm going to talk about today is how politics, economics, and fundamentals drive markets. And hopefully, by the end of this, not only will you go away with a better understanding of why market conditions are the way they are, but also a better understanding of causality. So there will be some technical trading stuff for those of you who are really, really keen on that. There'll be some really clever little tips and tricks that we use to monitor markets. And on the flip side of that, there will also be, hopefully you'll all walk away with a slightly better understanding of market causality and the wider economic and political spectrum within the markets and why you see those ranging markets my colleague talked about earlier. Right, okay. So, crude oil. First thing on the list, because, and primarily because, this is the best example of why anyone who says that the wider picture doesn't matter is fundamentally wrong. The reason they matter is because if you have a market where the US, top, top left, the US and the US economy and the President of the United States want oil below $70. Why do they want it below $70? What is it? What's driving that? It's political. Trump and the President of the United States want oil below $70 a barrel because it gives him a political advantage at home. But there's another thing playing there. He also wants a different political advantage. He wants to be able to look strong on the world stage. How does he do that? Iran sanctions. Sanctions on oil produced in Iran. That lowers, that lowers supply, which counteracts his goal of getting oil and keeping oil below $70 a barrel long term. Because if you limit supply and demand stays the same, prices rise. Venezuela, same sort of thing. Venezuela is relatively unstable at the moment. The, most of the Western world recognizes the leader of the opposition as the, new, as the new rightful president of Venezuela. I don't really care as long as it quietens down and we get on with trading. But at the same time, what that means is there are now sanctions on Venezuela, which again, lowers supply with stable demand. And if we've got lowering supply with stable demand, what we end up with is rising prices. So from there, China. US-China trade, you heard my colleague talk about it earlier. It is key to everything right now because China is the workshop of the world. And until that changes, a slowing China or a fenced-in China that cannot perform as it did this time five years ago, because 10 years ago China was doing 16, 17% growth every year. It's now doing more like five, maybe a little bit less if you account for the fact that their numbers tend to be a little bit less than true, in inverted commas. So, China needs oil, but it doesn't want to pay market rate for it because it needs so much of it. Cheap oil for China keeps prices low in the West. So it's kind of in our interest to keep prices low, in a way, but at the same time, on the world stage, the, the United States wants to say to China, our trade is unfair, our trade deficit is too big, and effectively, we must rebalance this because you're being mean to us. Then we have the UK, and we have a set price of what the UK wants oil to be. Now, it's worth, uh, it's worth pointing out that all the other prices 
our WTI apart from the UK because the UK is obviously Brent. For those of you who don't know, WTI is West Texas Intermediary, and it's effectively the most voluminous oil market. It's the one that most pe people commonly trade. However, it's a, light, it's a light crude, whereas Brent is a light sweet crude. All that really means is that you end up with less sulfur, and the less sulfur you've got, the better quality oil you've got. So it's priced slightly differently. So at $70 a barrel for WTI, you might get $74 a barrel for Brent. They're between $2 and $3 difference, traditionally. But what that means is there is, another per, there is another player in the oil market. And then we've got the Saudis. The Saudis try to stop shale and gas, shale oil and gas. As, again, as, as Luke showed you the chart earlier, 2016, the Saudis increased supply massively. They doubled, if not tripled, their supply. The Saudis can get an oil, oil, a barrel of oil out of the ground for $12 a barrel. Now, once you include transport and market up so they make some money, that's $36 a barrel is the, the baseline for what the Saudis can afford to get it out the ground at. They're part of OPEC. They're the major player in OPEC. And if OPEC can get prices that low, stop shale, gas, and oil, because that then has a political impact elsewhere around self-sufficiency for the United States and Western Europe, because that's where the most of the shale oil fields are. Then on top of that, you've got Russia. And this is a perfect example of why this stuff matters. The Russians can afford for oil to be at $42 a barrel, but they want it at $70 a barrel or more. The reason for that is because if oil is above $70 a barrel, it is seen as a key indicator in US elections, presidential elections. If oil is below $70 a barrel and the economy is growing, statistically there is a probability that the current president running for a second term gets a second term. So suddenly this market is not just oil. It's a presidential race. It's the future of the United States. No matter what side you fall on, oil is a key player in making life better for the individual. I mean, out of curiosity, how many people in this room own a car? Hands up, please. So nearly all of you. The difference at the pump that you see tends to be pretty little. That's because there is massive taxation in the United Kingdom on petrol, and diesel for that matter. In the US, there isn't. There's very, the, the fuel taxes are tiny. And as a result, fuel is much, much cheaper. But you drive that down, you drive down the cost of living, you drive down the cost of living, everybody feels better, and everybody goes, oh, isn't the president doing a wonderful job? So this market goes from being something you trade to also being something that is politically driven, centrally politically driven, by multiple different countries, all competing to get one advantage in one market or to change one thing. And as a result, what we're seeing is that up, down, up, down, up, down, range-bound trading that Luke was talking about this morning. Because one week, one country wins, the next, the next. And you can even go as far as to say OPEC weeks when there's an OPEC meeting, you tend to see negative sentiment within WTI. Week after, you can just about guarantee there'll be a tweet from Donald Trump saying, I want oil prices to be lower. And then the Saudis come in, pull it back up a little bit, or the Russians come in and pull it back up a little bit. And that fight has been going on for three years. It's got especially interesting in the last two. But once we know range-bound trading, then we can start to look at highs and lows, and we can start to apply our technical principles. But understanding why that happens allows you, as a trader, to find your place in that market, to find your perspective, and to find your advantage or understanding that leads to you feeling that a trade is statistically probable to go in your direction. So, that's oil. Any questions on oil? Anybody? Any questions on oil? No? Okay. Nope. So, the United States. I'm guessing that most of you think about the United States right now in terms of the President of the United States. Most of you, hands up, who who thinks about the US economy more than thinking about Donald Trump? We've got one, two, three, four, five, six. Six of you, seven. 
Um, well done you, <laughs> honestly, because of this. So effectively, that's the United States. That is basically a breakdown of all of the major factors either being produced by the United States as issues or being stopped by the United States as issues. So we'll start, I think we'll probably start in the far corner with the US-China trade dispute. I refuse to call it a trade war because for technically, economically speaking, it only becomes a trade war if you get escalating steps, not the US doing something heavy tariffs and the Chinese responding with just enough to say we're doing something about it. We're not seeing the escalation. The US put 200 billion um, tariff, 25 percent tariffs on 200 billion, the Chinese responded with 10 percent tariffs on 60 billion. Last time round was the same thing. So we're not seeing the China, we're seeing the Chinese try to avoid escalating that. Why is that important? Because the Chinese don't want to escalate a trade dispute because it slows their economy. A slowing Chinese economy leads to slowing world growth. Slowing world growth leads to falling markets. That in turn leads to, well, slowing world growth leads to falling GDP, which leads to lower demand, which leads to lower salaries, which in turn then leads to all of us being poorer. Free trade is has made the West rich, and it's now making China rich. So, why does that matter? Why does it matter? You put the US on the world stage. You say, right, okay, actually, you know what? We're gonna do this slightly differently. Why does it matter? That is a 2016 electoral map of the presidential race. What we care about is the big states. Florida, Florida, Texas, Indiana, Illinois, Ohio, and Michigan right there at the top, and this slightly oblong looking one, Pennsylvania. They're the key battleground states at the next election. They're gonna be key to winning the next election. If a Democrat cannot sweep those five states, they do not win. They lose a single one, and they do not win the election because of the electoral math. Basically, if they cannot win, Texas, Florida, Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, and Michigan, game over. Because the Republicans are strong everywhere else. So, if the Republicans need to win another presidential race, how do they do it? How do they make it happen? What is it that makes them choose tariffs? Tariffs are political. They make no economic sense at all. Donald Trump will tweet regularly, the President of the United States tweets, tweets regularly, that China is now paying 25% tariffs on its goods. China isn't paying 25%. The US consumer is paying 25%, along with losing access to cheap steel, cheap coal, and cheap manufactured goods. Now, the result of that is higher cost of living. This is a poverty map of the United States. It's a poverty map. So, levels of poverty. I checked this morning because I just wanted to make sure. Poverty in the United Kingdom runs at around, below the, below the poverty line is about 4% of the UK population. Poverty within the European Union as a whole is around 8 to 12%. Now, the base on this, the grey, is 11%. So, nowhere in the United States is, is poverty below 11%, apart from in, in Maine, basically, and a little bit in the far corner. Why does that matter? Because if you want to win a presidential election, you've got to make people feel like they're getting richer. You've got to make people feel like they're improving. So. You pick your states that you're going to target. The South, Trump's vice president. That's his job. This big box at the bottom, Texas and Florida, that is the vice president's job. Good old-fashioned, American-style Christian values, big drive, that's all they need to do, plus a few little tricks like what's going on in Alabama at the moment um, that will fail in the end but effectively create political noise. So all we really care about is that box at the top, 
And you can see the poverty levels there. These people have been left behind. They've not felt like they've had a president work for them. So tariffs show Trump going out into the world stage. They show him strong, leader-like. Leader they show him fighting for those people's jobs in those states. That's the Rust Belt. I don't, does anybody here know what the Rust Belt is? Any hands for the Rust Belt? One. One, I think. Um, the Rust Belt is the manufacturing zone of the United States. For example, Michigan, cars. Illinois, computer parts, bridges, bits of steel. It's, it's basically good old-fashioned industrial production and manufacturing. So why does that poverty map and Trump's want to win an election matter? Because his policies are designed to create certainty that he is fighting for those people in that area. And he does that through tariffs, trade negotiations, by talking about other countries taking US jobs. US jobs aren't taken by, by migrant labor. They're not taken by, they're not even exported to other countries. Most of the loss of jobs in that area is down to automation. Detroit the car capital of the world, went bankrupt, not because it was making less cars, but because it needed less people to make less cars. Automation is the key. But that doesn't sell to the public. So if Trump wants to win the next election, he's got to say, I am fighting for you, these people here. And the best way to do that is to show them, and to show them by fighting back against unfair trade practices, and by using tariffs. Tariffs are incredibly effective in, as a stage of negotiation. They are completely impractical long term. So why does all of that matter? It matters because five states on this map become the entirety of the US political agenda. Keeping Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, and Michigan, and Pennsylvania happy and getting them to vote Republican becomes the United States' prime agenda. And to do that, that is all the US cares about right now. And everything else is driven. We've just looked at oil. We've just seen that oil needs to be below $70 a barrel for the president to be happy. He, he wants that because it makes these people live better. He wants tariffs because it shows those people that he is fighting for them and he wins the next election. So all of the world's, all of the trade instability bar the U UK EU trade is as a result of those people, as a result of five states in the United States. And you can usually work out when a politician is about to tweet, when they're about to share something new, when it's going to affect the market, by looking at the polling numbers in these areas. When Trump's support drops below 43%, tweet over and over again. You need to do something. You need to show them that you care. Here, have some tweets. I'm going to be mean to China. Now, effectively, why does that matter? Because everybody the market reacts to good news about the China-US trade deal. Oh, they're having meetings, it's going well, there'll probably be a deal soon. If that is the President of the United States' job to win the next election, do you think he's going to take China off the table before he wins? He's going to take his biggest opportunity to bang the drum for those people that need to vote for him? Of course he's not. So, we're able to then say, look at the risk portfolio. What's the likelihood of a deal? Small. So, if that bit's small, what's the likelihood of continued uncertainty? What's the likelihood that the US dollar reacts to this ongoing? High. So then we look at meetings, we look at what they're saying, and we can start to work out when these moments <coughs> of risk are coming into the market. And then my lovely colleague comes in and he goes, right, okay, we'll change our position sizing on that. We'll limit our risk over here. All of it is down to five states. So, the disenfranchised effect. We're looking at direct action, direct intervention. That's what I'm talking about. If you've only got to please people living in four states, 
then what they want to see is their guy working for them. And if that's the case, what they want to see is a tweet. What they want to see is direct action. They want to see Trump tell China that it's not working. So, trade imbalances. Use tariffs to make it look like you're doing something to, make, to create more jobs. US currency market volatility. Don't let the dollar get too high, because if it gets too high, imports are cheap, yes. But if it gets too high, exports are expensive. And we've got to remember, those states are manufacturing states. They are exporting states. So they want a weak dollar. So now we start talking about the dollar, and we start saying, right, OK, so oil below this so that Trump can win the next election. We then say, right, OK, dollar below this so that exports are possible, so we see the, the income from a rise in manufacturing caused by those tariffs, if there is one. Then from there, we look at the Federal Reserve interest rates. I mean, who here heard Donald Trump last week literally say, if the Federal Reserve would just cut interest rates, we'd win our trade war with China? He said that twice last week. The Federal Reserve is a central bank. It's independent. But the moment you start calling that independence into question, gold will go back to being a safe haven. So we've got to, we've got to build that in, too. What's the likelihood that the market loses trust? in the US dollar. It's low right now, but if we continue the way we're going, it's likely to rise. Then, US indices growth. Again, Donald Trump, the President of the United States, wants to see, he wants to see rising stock markets, because that is the figure, the Dow Jones Industrial Average is the figure that Trump has chosen to mark whether the economy is succeeding. So, he says the Dow's going up, Look at how high it is. It's at record highs. Yes, it is, but that's down to QE and many, many other factors. But again, low interest rates, if he can push interest rates down and get the Fed to push interest rates down, then the Dow will continue to climb because there's a direct, there's a counter-correlated effect between interest rates and indices. And because you, why put it in the bank if you can make more putting it on the stock exchange? Um, so as a result of that, Immediately, Trump's policies, the President of the United States, the elections, no matter what side you sit on, have a, those five states suddenly become the most important thing in the entire world because they're driving oil prices, they're driving the US dollar, they're driving indices, they're driving US interest rates. All of those factors have a huge impact on the world economy. And then on top of that, because those five states are... Exporters, Trump wants a better deal over trade. So that then destabilizes the that then destabilizes Chinese growth, which has a knock-on effect. As I don't know if you noticed, but earlier you'll notice the Australians just here. Australia, 70% of its entire export market is to China. So a slowing China results in a slowing Australia. And then we're adding the Australian dollar into the case of weakening Australian dollar, weakening US dollar. All of these factors play out every day. May it be Trump announcing something on Friday, the Chinese announcing something last Monday. It happens every day. Then, on, then we've got OPEC and that, the oil environment that we've just talked about, the Federal Reserve. Trump's not just renegotiating with China. He's also doing it with the EU. Of course he is. He's got to win those four states. Five if you include Florida, but looking at the polling numbers, it doesn't look like he'll win Florida. Um, and all because these places haven't been looked after. And I'll, before I move on to other economies and get a little bit more trading, um, I wanted to round off with the idea of this bit is heartland Christian values. So the Vice President of the United States, that is his job. This bit at the top over here, there are no votes there. Comparatively, th let me, uh, that way. Those three, four, six states along the top, it looks like a big chunk of the United States. They have the same number of votes as Pennsylvania. One slightly oblong looking state over here. He wins Pennsylvania. He doesn't have to worry about those. He doesn't win the East Coast because that votes Democrat. He doesn't win the top right-hand corner because that votes Democrat. 
So we're down to five states. At the moment, we're down to five states. They all want the same thing, weirdly enough. And if they all want the same thing, bar possibly Texas, because obviously they're a massive oil producer, but most of that is consumed internally anyway, so it's kind of an irrelevance. Um, but they also have lots of manufacturing. So we're down to five states, driving the entire world economy. One election, five states, driving the entire world economy. Brilliant. So free trade, balance of trade, trade deficits versus global growth. We've talked about that. North American Free Trade Agreement. Who saw that on Friday? Did anybody see that? Yeah. And did you hear my colleague Luke talk about the fact that they waited until the market was closing to announce it? Anybody got an idea why they did that? What do you think that does to the Dow on Monday? What do you think it does to the dollar on Monday? Less risk, less uncertainty. Markets like certainty, and you'll hear myself and my colleagues all say the same thing. Markets like certainty. So when I sit down on Sunday to look at the week ahead with my team, the first thing we'll do is reassess the risk parameters of every single currency pair out there because the risk has just changed hugely. Because now Canada is looking like it gets its free trade agreement, which will be good for, CAD, for the CAD and good for, for the US dollar. <coughs> and Mexico the same. We don't really trade the Mexican peso because um, it's known as the Mexican jumping bean um, because it will jump 200 pips and then do nothing for five hours and then jump another 200 pips. Um, those core trade deals, once they're done, provide certainty. Trump wants a deal with the US and Mexico because it shows that he is a statesman. It shows that there is a reason for this. If it's a bit painful in the short term, we will get there. And if watch the news next week. I will guarantee you right now one thing. Trump will say, we have got there because I used tariffs, if he hasn't already. And then he will use that argument to un underpin his argument talking tough with China. So short-term win for the northern American economies versus a longer-term uncertainty that he can use as a political tool. So what are we looking for in terms of what does the market care about? GDP growth over the next three quarters. US GDP is high, but Trump cut taxes. He cut taxes for businesses. 80% of that tax cut, that big famous tax cut that Trump talked about all the time and so did, so did, um, so did the US press, only 20% of that ever went into anybody's pockets, earning below about $50,000. $50, and I'll, I'll reference um, the lovely Ricardo who spoke right at the beginning of today and said the average earnings of a person in the United States is $31,000 thousand dollars a year. That's about 24,000 pounds. Maybe 25. Um, but effectively, that tax cut didn't go where it was supposed to go. It went into businesses. Why does that matter? Because businesses will grow. But if that money isn't cycled through the economy, you get a sudden spike in GDP, and then you get once a year when they report their end of year profits, but you don't get the real wage growth. You don't get the stuff that makes us as individuals feel richer and happier and makes a difference to your life. And the problem with that is then you don't get consumer demand. If you don't get consumer demand, you don't get retail sales. And if you don't get retail sales, you lose all of that employment. So then suddenly the employment figures change and then that affects GDP. So there's a huge risk but it's a game, it's playing one thing off against each other. So the market is watching those quarterly GDP figures to make sure they're realistic and to make sure the US economy is actually growing. And they're good at the moment. They are above 3%. That's fantastic comparative to the rest of the world. But skipping down to the bottom, are we seeing inflation? Are we actually seeing inflation within the United States? No, not really. As a result, the market is going, the inflation isn't there. Yeah, jobs are rising, but real wages aren't. And suddenly you've got a split. The headline figures say the US is doing very, very well and the underlying figures say the complete opposite, which is why we're seeing the uncertainty in the dollar. Why, when Luke talked about the dollar versus the euro this morning, he asked you, which one do you think is doing better? And most people said the US dollar, but we're not seeing the inflation. We're not seeing the underlying figures. 
And as a result of that, we're seeing risk, huge amounts of risk. Risk is good. Risk isn't bad. Risk is good because it creates volatility. It creates opportunity in the market. But for it to be good, you have to understand how to use it, which means not understanding all of what I'm saying, but understanding that some of it needs just to be watched, just to keep an eye on. And some of it, like the Chinese trade negotiations, can probably just about be ignored until something meaningful happens. But you still need to keep an eye on it to know the difference. Right, so, promised some trading stuff, I did. So, all of that political stuff, we've just gone through a huge amount of political information and a lot of economic information. Why does that all matter? Because risk in market is reflected most heavily in your forward futures markets. So you're looking at the futures market in comparison to the basket. So what we've got here is the US dollar basket against the, so a weighted average of all of the different currencies that trade with the US dollar, and that is a reflection of the true value of the US dollar. When we compare that then to the futures markets, the, well, it's actually forward next futures, so not next month's contract, the contract after that, we get an early indicator of when markets are likely to change direction. It's not guaranteed to work, but every single one of those lines is an instance where it worked. Because what we are seeing is futures markets having to price in the risk much earlier than they used to because situations are changing much faster. So all of that political stuff we just talked about, all of that stuff around Donald Trump making decisions to please those four, four, five states, is reflected in the futures market. It's reflected in the dollar basket as well. But if you can find those turning points, then you can seek a, a statistical advantage. Obviously, you've got to match that with then your technicals on a pair-by-pair -pair basis, but effectively, it gives you an early warning sign that you can then confirm or deny. So, on to the euro. Eurozone. How am I doing for time? I'm, I'm guessing I'm talking really slowly. Um, so, on to the eurozone. We have the EU-China trade. So, Donald Trump, the President of the United States, or as my colleague would prefer I called it, um, the US machine, because um, it's not so much Donald Trump as it, it is the machinery of government. Um, the US is renegotiating trade with China. So the EU is renegotiating trade with China. Why would the EU allow the US to get better terms if they're not getting better terms as well? It makes sense from a protectionist point of view. But on the flip side of that, Again, we're pushing back Chinese demand. We're pushing back how well China is doing. And in doing so, we are effectively limiting Chinese growth, and in doing so, effectively, effectively limiting world growth. So, that is a fact. And you heard my, I'll say it again, you heard Luke earlier talking about the principle that the entire thing is down to trade. What I'm saying is, yes, a lot of it is down to trade, but don't forget those four states. Then, obviously, with the euro, future trading relationship with the United Kingdom. I will make one thing very clear. I'm, I'm a relatively good economist. I've worked for the Bank of England. I've worked for massive institutions um, in this city. And I've also worked for, I worked for Obama for a bit, and I've worked for Angela, Angela Merkel as well. And I did a stint um, in Israel under Netanyahu as well. Um, and I advised on the Greek crisis for years. Um, Nobody cares about Brexit is the point. The reason I just gave you a potted history of my, of my time is because nobody cares about Brexit. You will never hear one of my staff say the word Brexit other than to say it's pointless and we don't care. No matter where you sit on the political spectrum, no matter where you sit on the political spectrum, if you are a trader, Brexit is an irrelevance because all it is is a political game. What we care about is certainty and clarity. So what we care about is, is this thing going to happen on this date? If it is, what are the conditional logics? My, my colleague would call them scenarios. Conditional logics. 
if this happens, this happens, then this happens, then that is the outcome. That's all the trader cares about. It's not the politics. It's not the noise. You'll hear me talk a lot about different things, but the whole point of all of this is to get rid of the noise and find out the bits that actually matter. All the markets care about in relation to the United Kingdom and the EU is when can we guarantee there will be a trade deal? And from there, when can we guarantee there will be a services deal? Because the withdrawal agreement's all great and good. We have no trade deal. The United Kingdom and the EU has no trade deal. The EU has never done a services agreement. All trade deals are based on the physical movement of goods when it comes to the EU. Because they've never needed a financial services sector because London had been smack bang there to do it and was the world capital of financial services. As a result, all the market wants to actually see is a trade deal followed by a services deal, followed by an access deal, and most important, parity between the Bank of England and the ECB in terms of rules and regulations. That's all the market cares about, because once it knows that, it's got certainty that money will flow around the world as it has done for decades. And the moment it knows that, it'll go, right, actually, the political situation we don't really care about. We're going to move on now and get back to trading. Brexit doesn't matter, and I think that would be one of the two things that I was very keen to hopefully let you take away, is that all of the US stuff comes down to five states, and all of the Brexit stuff comes down to a services agreement. Nobody cares about anything else. So, European Central Bank. Inflation problems, slowing German economic slowdown in the top corner. What you've effectively got is a slowing Germany. Okay, the data this week wasn't too bad, but that's the first marginally good GDP data out of Germany in nine months. It's not, it is slowing slightly. And it's slowing because Germany is reliant, as the workshop of Europe, it's reliant on people buying its goods. The German mark used to be incredibly strong. Joining the euro brought that down. It made its goods more accessible to the European Union. As a result of that, the slowdowns in Greece, well, slowdown is the wrong word for what's going on in Greece. Um, Greece, Italy, Spain, not so much Portugal, um, and France are having a direct impact on Germany's ability to sell. And as a result of that, we are seeing a, a slowdown. When we then combine that with political mistakes, made by the leader of the CDU. Does anybody know who the leader of the CDU is? Go on. Yeah, Angela Merkel. It's a political party nobody's ever heard of, other than the fantastic chap at the back over there. Um, it is the majority party. Well, it's the largest party in Germany, in a coalition. Angela Merkel has been in charge of the German economy and a major player on the world stage and a, the most prominent player within the EU since the introduction of the Euro, since Europe began to become one pure trading block with one currency. She's disappeared off the face of the earth because she made some political mistakes, she dealt with some crises in a way that the German people weren't particularly happy with, that then led to the rise of an organisation called the AFD, the um, um, Alternative for Deutschland, um, which is effectively a far-right group. And the entirety of German politics has moved very slightly to the right, and there's no longer the place for her on the liberal left. And as a result, she's not on the political world stage anymore. And as a result, Europe is much poorer for it, and so is Germany. Angela Merkel is still the Chancellor, but in name only. A bit like Theresa May. We know she's going, we just don't know when. Um, and as a result, Germany hasn't got its place on the stage, which means Europe is poorer for it. And because Europe is poorer for it, it's struggling to negotiate a trade deal with the United Kingdom. It's struggling to renegotiate its trade deal with the US. It's struggling to renegotiate with China because there is no strong leadership. And suddenly we're back to politics having a direct impact on the value of the euro every day. 
because with strong leadership, you get clarity. And with clarity, you get stable markets that trend. And what we all really want is a nice trend we can get into here and get out of there, like it used to be. <laughs> so global demand, especially in Asia and within the EU, weakening off. And as a result of that, the German economy is slowing. Rolling credit facilities and availability of credit slash depth of market within the EU. <clears throat> I'm going to spend a couple of seconds on this one because there's also the one thing we haven't mentioned yet, which is finance, actual mathematical finance, the giving and receiving of money. It's important too. Rolling credit facilities are a posh city term for corporate overdrafts. So a German car maker has a 10 billion euro overdraft. It spends some of that to buy the bits to build cars and pay for its plant and everything else. It then builds the car. It then sells the car, pays off a chunk of the overdraft and repeats the process. But we come back to a trade agreement, a services agreement, because once upon a time, those rolling credit facilities cost 0.25% interest. You can't even get that on the market anymore. The city is saying right now that it should be, those credit facilities should be somewhere between 1% to 2%. Banks lose money on overdrafts. They give them to businesses so that they can effectively take the good bit of their business and it sort of covers the, the cost of borrowing the money and making sure there's an endless supply available to the business to build cars or factories or houses. The reason it matters is if you go from a quarter of a percent to two, that's being passed on to the business. So overnight, with the uncertainty over the UK, EU, trade deal and specifically the services deal, we end up with an increase in costs to car, German car makers, as an example, of 1.75% overnight. And that figure is only going to get worse because the banks have to plan in the risk. You don't plan in that risk, you end up with a slowdown. And the slowdown then has a knock-on effect on the rest of Europe and suddenly the euro is falling. GDP comes out and it's weaker and it causes a fall in the euro. So we've just gone from UK services agreement to Germany and trade to then weakening demand within the EU to then a weakening political environment to then more cost to businesses and then as a result of that a slowdown in the EU and from that slowdown weakening off of the euro. That's a long way to walk. But by the time we get to this end, we have actionable insight that applies to the market. And once we've got that actionable insight, we can then use that to frame risk and sentiment within the market, and from there, look at opportunities within the market. Cool. And again, we are looking at next contract futures against the euro basket, and effectively, again, we get early indicators. One of the things I would also point out is the bond market has always been key to the euro. These are near zero. The two-year and 10-year yield rates are near zero. The reason they're near zero, zero is because of this, the conundrum, the central bank conundrum. The ECB runs the euro effectively. On one side, it's got a huge balance sheet that it really could do with start paying down. But there's no inflation, so it can't. So it just has to sit there. So we see rising stock markets, because the money has to live somewhere. It's got to maintain low bond yields, so that countries like Italy, Greece, and Spain, and to some extent France as well, can afford to pay their debts, or at least the interest on their debts. On the flip side, it's got interest rates in the US at 2.5%. That's huge. Why would you invest in an economy that's running negative interest rates when you can invest in an economy that's growing and will give you 2.5% if you just even put your money in that country and do nothing with it. The ECB is in a very, very weak position. It, it has to make a decision one way or the other. Low domestic inflation combined with the need to maintain bot low bond yields mean high unemployment in certain areas of the EU, high government debt levels in Greece, Italy, Spain, and the German economic slowdown. That means the ECB has to print money. 
It's got to print money to keep the system afloat. But at the same time, if it prints money to keep the system afloat, it can't normalize interest rates, which means it can't fix the problem. So what we find from that is that the euro is likely to be in a weakened state for a while. But then, how is it stronger than the US dollar at the moment? How is it more trustworthy than the US dollar? Because these problems we know about, and they're not going to change anytime soon. And if we know about them, I've kind of done that one. If we know about them, we can do this. And this is a special thanks to my head of desk who did the research on this to prove this work so I could stick it up here legally. Um, what we have is the orange line is the Italian 10-year bond yield. The blue line is the euro basket. So the total value of the euro effectively reflected in the real world. And then the, the cyan line is the DAX, the German exchange. There is a counter-correlated relationship between the way the euro behaves and the way the Italian bond yield behaves. The reason for that is all economic, it's all political. Italy is in financial trouble, and as a result of that requires the ECB to print money so that it can afford to pay the interest on its existing debt. If that's the case, then the ECB can't, can't start upping interest rates. Um, I can't see how long that is, I haven't got my glass. Five, okay. The ECB can't start upping interest rates, which means that they can't fix the problem. So we have this sensitivity, this glorious sensitivity, where we have an indicator that is so sensitive to economic conditions within the euro, it is, again, showing us large turning points within the euro. And if it's showing us large turning points within the euro, we can find trends that are tradable within euro pairs. All of that economic data I just described is why that works. And that is an early indicator doesn't work all the time, as you can see, but it's an early indicator you can then confirm with your own technical processes. Brilliant. Right, I've only got five minutes, so I think we'll do Japan very quickly. Japan, very, very simple, very, very simple. Why is the Japanese yen so weak, and why has it continued to see a weakening environment long term? Well. It's got an aging population. 30% of Japan's population is over the, age of uh, over the age of 60. That compares to the United Kingdom, where it is 18%. There are so many, so many people over the age of 60 that their population pyramid has inverted. So there are more people above 60 than being born. A population pyramid should be this way up. Theirs is the other way up. What that means is they're not raising enough tax revenue because there aren't enough workers to pay tax and they have an expanding state in terms of pension deficits, in terms of actually providing the welfare state. As a result of that, they desperately need to raise money. So they want to introduce a new sales tax, which they've moved back three times already, but it's supposed to come in, in October. They have no GDP because they haven't got, anybody, they haven't got enough people to produce stuff. And as a result, this sales tax, if it's implemented in October, will, is forecast to result in a fall of GDP equivalent to 2%. As a result of that, that will be the worst data Jap Japan has seen in decades. Inflation will rise, but not by a lot. There is no real inflation within Japan. It's about 1.4, 1.5. But a lot of that is to do with bank holidays and intervention from the back of the Japanese bank. So what does that all mean? It means that higher inflation for Japan, even offset by oil and low oil prices, and even offset by the Bank of Japan not taking any action at all to what they're currently doing, we would be looking for negative sentiment within the yen over the coming year. As soon as October kicks along, they introduce, if they introduce, introduce the sales tax, we will see a falling environment because that tax lowers GDP, it lowers the amount people have to spend, and it has a negative impact. How do you deal with that? Well, that's really simple. It's really, really simple. They need more people. 
that's the only solution. They need more people, they need migration. And until they change that, we are looking at a falling environment, a negative environment within the JPY. Right, I'm out of time. Um, thank you for listening. I'll hand back over to the wonderful Ricardo. Thank you very much.